Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is Ben Lee from Rios Contra Cancer. And today I'm going to talk about strategic vision for volunteering with Rios Contra Cancer. Uh, all of us, I think, share a passion for patients and a special place in our heart for trying to address health disparities where they exist not just domestically but around the world. And we see an opportunity right now for improving our efforts against cancer care. Uh, right now, it's an uh, interesting time. Uh, I'm seeing lots of growing interest, uh, not just within academia, but within industry and within other organizations. Uh, Rios Contra Cancer has a special niche in being able to help with radiation oncology development, which we believe uh, contributes uh, a big part of the picture in improving patient lives. So I'll start by asking, why do you do what you do. And this isn't just a personal question, but this actually is a question I've had to ask about Rios Contra Cancer. And so today I'm going to go over why does RCC exist? What is the problem we're actually addressing? What are the ways to approach this problem? And amongst the sea of possibilities for how we could tackle cancer care, what is RCC's path and strategic vision? I'll show a bit of a personal narrative in reflecting upon organizational versus individual activities, and then review Rios Country Cancer progress, how we can all work together, and a roadmap forward where I'll define success for the next six months, for the next year, and a five-year vision. Finally, I'll conclude with uh, some roles that we can play together and uh, a farewell. So, the first question, what is the problem we are trying to address? How do we improve the radiation experience, including treatment timeliness, quality, and affordability for as many people as possible in limited resource settings? Everything that we do is trying to address this problem. And imagine a billionaire approaches you and says, I admire the problem you're trying to address. How can I help you? What would you tell this person? This was an interesting question that I hadn't asked myself because a lot of times we, we think in terms of budget constraints. But really, if, if we could do anything, what would we do? So here are ways that we can approach the problem. There are many ways. There's probably no single best way. But I believe that establishing a framework will help us understand what we are doing as well as what others are doing. So in consulting, there's something called the MISI framework, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. And it's, it's a way of categorizing all the different approaches in a, an exhaustive way. So how do we improve the radiation experience for as many people as possible? Well, we could focus on clinics, we could focus on human resources, or we could focus on the health system infrastructure. In clinics, uh, you can focus on hardware, software, marginal costs, fixed costs, and then the branches continue. Human resources, you can focus on people, new people, uh, more talent. You could focus on the specific uh, licensing training or residency training, or you could focus on ongoing training, increasing number of opportunities, decreasing the cost, and improving quality. And in the health system infrastructure, we could focus on the patient demographics, the geography, where they come from, different characteristics like their health habits, cultural attitudes towards radiation, uh, what are the things that influence treatment decisions. We could try to address corruption. We could focus on the attitudes of the government. Uh, we could focus on integrating a uh, health system with radiation, uh, improving health records, uh, improving provider relationships, or even referral lines. And lastly, there's a perpendicular axis to each of these approaches. We could focus on improving our measurement. We could focus on expanding that approach to more geographies. And we can support new and existing player efforts that are invested in that particular approach. And put all together, this is my first version of a mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive set of approaches that Rios Country Cancer 
is looking at, along with many other people, in trying to figure out how do we improve the radiation experience for as many people as possible. I've had the privilege of meeting many others in, in this path and in this journey, and I believe that we can map ourselves and see where we fit on this map. Like I said, there's no one single right approach, but this is an important framework to figure out what are you doing and what are others doing. So what is Rios Contra Cancer's path and strategic vision? It's easy to do things, and I think all of us can do lots of things. And all of us are here on this call because we share a, a vision and a desire to, to care. But it takes strategy to do things well as a team. So the first phase is establishing uh, a common vision, a shared mission and making sure that we're rowing in the same direction. I think we've achieved that. Uh, we're one and a half years into existence now, and I think we've accomplished a lot, uh, generally rowing in the same direction to, to get things done. Uh, now phase two, evaluate what we're doing and let's refine our approach. So here's a map of some of Rios Contra Cancer's current activities in green as well as rising prospects in blue. Uh, as you can see, uh, AI can affect the design of clinics, uh, could improve the workflow, which ultimately will decrease marginal cost to uh, improve care. Um, we're partnered with Radiating Hope and trying to do what we can to decrease the costs uh, for uh, requiring old equipment, uh, which can be used to, to help clinics. Um, and then some of my medical physics co-residents uh, have very interesting ideas for new QA tools or innovative things that could decrease the cost. In human personnel, we've built programs for radiation oncologists, for medical physicists, uh, some that focus on residency programs, and others that focus on continuing medical education or ongoing training. We're trying to increase the number of opportunities to these, decrease the cost of them, and improve the quality that's available. And in our prospects, uh, we're looking to build these programs for radiation therapists and involved dosimetrists as well. And lastly, in the health system infrastructure, this is probably where we've touched the least on, probably recognizing our own limitations of it. It's hard to really understand what's going on unless you are there in person and immersed and a lot of what we do is remote but i do believe that we are affecting the attitudes at least of providers for encouraging high quality technique and in the future as our advocacy grows we may affect clinics and governments and so i showed this to someone and they said wow this sure looks like a lot of different things you're doing uh, but it looks like your strength is kind of right here in education and training. So why are you spending time focusing on the other things? Wouldn't it help more people if you spent that same energy just reinvesting it into your education and training and making it better? Uh, and if your ultimate goal is to the, improve the singular outcome, improving the radiation experience, should you focus on what you do best? And then I was challenged, are you deviating from your goal with, with random individual activities? And my mind was blown. All this time I'd been thinking that everything that we're doing, you know, rowing in the same direction, working towards the same goal was, was a very strong approach. But if we really treat this like an organization, uh, almost like a, a company, with a business mindset that we are trying to uh, improve our, our singular objective, then maybe we need to refine our approach. And here's where I learned about organizational versus individual activities and recognizing the difference and strength of each. Rather than trying to take many different paths at once, this organization could focus on a singular path and really blaze it. And this is the path that I think we are suited as an organization to, to really go forward. And 
so what is an organizational activity? It's specific roles with step-by-step -step instructions. You're, you're hired as a job and you're given a list of responsibilities and your roles work in synchrony and synergistically. Whereas individual activities, there, no one is commanding you. There's, if you're a free-spirited explorer, um, although there's a risk of some of your actions being redundant, poorly coordinated, and not working in synchrony. Now there's pros and cons for each of these. Uh, for an organizational activity, you can achieve mechanical efficiency. Uh, you have that cog in a wheel structure, and if everyone cooperates, you can move fast and far. The con is that you feel like a cog in the wheel. Uh, it could be lack of individual inspiration, it could be burnout. And I think this is common in the corporate world. As for individual activities, some of the pros is uh, lots of creativity. What you choose to do is 100% aligned with your interests, and you can bring ideas for innovation and new opportunities. The cons are that it's limited by just yourself, your individual efficiency, and it may not be structured towards a clear goal. Your interests may overshadow those team goals. No one's disciplining you towards a specific metric. And I asked myself, where do, where do I sit? And I started to put myself right here. Uh, I spent a lot of time on Rios Country Cancer, but I'll admit that a lot of this is very individually gratifying and I might spend 30 minutes just talking with a physicist or a radiation oncologist in another country, not necessarily because it's accomplishing something, but it's, it's personally rewarding and I feel like I learn new things. And then I was asked, where would you propose volunteers sit? And I think I would put volunteers in the middle a balance of organizational activities and individual activities. So here's the mission command. Um, and this is a phrase that I learned from the military, which is actually a very successful example of organization. And applying this to rise country cancer, I believe can help maximize our mission. Education and training programs. We create, administer, and measure longitudinal curriculum programs to clinics with functioning medical equipment, but gaps in education and training. RCC is the only certified uh, RADONC program of Project ECHO, which is a tested model for using telementoring to empower medical experts in underserved communities. Our programs connect our pool of volunteers uh, who are experts to cohorts of clinics who share a need for specific medical education and training and the experts work together to improve the quality of treatments provided at each center. We facilitate multi-institutional collaboration, we mobilize medical professionals and students, and we incorporate cloud-based technology in our initiatives. So if someone asks you, what's the thing that Rios Country Cancer does the most? This is the one slide you would show them. We had many different branches of, of ongoing things, but if, if we are going to really focus and build mechanical efficiency, I believe we should focus on this. What have we uh, have accomplished so far? We have uh, curriculum offerings for SBRT and SRS, high dose rate Reiki therapy, uh, transitioning from 3D to IMRT, and head and neck contouring and plan evaluation, which is our newest curriculum. Um, we leverage the experience from, from you guys, from, from experts, and uh, generally there's a lead educator and several supporting educators who will teach the session during a longitudinal telehealth program. Each session is about one hour, typically given one to two times per week over the span of three to four months. And we have a nice culture where we foster an intimate peer-to-peer -peer learning environment and encourage discussion between and among clinics in real time. In our first three cohorts, we completed uh, training for 19 clinics in 11 countries, and this impacted the care of over 10,000 cancer patients who will be receiving treatment per year with radiation. We have encouraged department-wide participation at each of these clinics and require official endorsement from clinic administration. So everyone's on board. It's not just a, a random webinar that some people in the clinic are joining. Participants have included medical physicists, radiation oncologists, residents, and technologists, 
And among our first three cohorts, 83 individuals have participated, 50 of them successfully attending over 70% of sessions within the curriculum. Every curriculum has demonstrated improvements in all of the uh, competencies that we've measured based on our pre and post training participant surveys. And coming up is cohort four, which uh, actually just started yesterday and cohort five, which is uh, looking to start in March. After each telehealth training, we strive to complete a one to two week on-site training visit subject to funding for a volunteer education, vol volunteer educators travel costs. And uh, presently, four clinics have received on-site training and eight additional clinics have on-site training visits that are currently being planned. How does it work? Uh, there's a pre-launch phase, there's the education and training phase, and then there's the sustaining phase. And the, the people working these are our administrators, which tend to be student and resident teams. Uh, we have moderators who are um, either advanced students or, uh, or residents. We have the educators. Um, but really, uh, when I designed Rios Country Cancer, I, I saw a lot of people were interested in helping, but we are all busy in <laughs> clinic. <laughs> Uh, we don't necessarily have time to, to plan and to do these giant things, but we certainly are willing if there was an hour given to us to help. And so Rise Country Cancer makes everything possible in the background. Our med students and our grad students um, can fill uh, one of three roles, either contacting clinics in the native language, um, assisting and coordinating clinic schedules, surveys, and MOU agreements and uh, contacting and coordinating educators. Residents from the PGY level and up, the PGY one level and up uh, can build upon existing interests. They can establish connections with motivated students, educators, and LMIC clinics. They help design curriculum with supportive faculty. They can help moderate the sessions. Uh, just like an Astro, we have session moderators. We take the same approach here and provide specialty insight for medical students. Uh, we have the Aero Global Health Subcommittee, which I think has uh, 20 or 30 different residents. And uh, one thing I learned is that uh, not every resident is super gung-ho global health. Some are global health light. And so here we have an option for those global health lights where even signing up to moderate one hour in the curriculum could be helpful. And then the global health heavy, uh, you could help lead a curriculum. Um, and as you see with our structure, each of these structures could be scaled to new regions. And then we have the educators who help either remotely or with in-person education and training. They can build teaching materials when we have new curriculum and uh, deliver one hour education and training sessions. Uh, the on-site training would be one to two week training visits after the remote training blocks. For those who are global health heavy, um, they could lead curriculum design and help or review the presentations of other educators. And we had a team of three or four um, heavy educators who really helped our HDR brachytherapy be the success that it was. Um, and we've had some other volunteers, some who, who weren't even ed, uh, remote educators, but purely on-site educators. And uh, then we have Global Health Light, who could uh, sign up and help with one session or more. Um, if we have an existing curriculum, the content's already made, so it really could just be a one-hour commitment, although we would like to refine and make each curriculum better and better. And if it's a new curriculum, uh, there's a rule of thumb that for every one hour of presenting, it takes about eight hours to develop a high-quality presentation. So I would put this at about a nine-hour commitment. And for case-based learning, uh, where there is no lecture slide to present, and build. Um, it's just showing up and helping provide peer-to-peer uh, -peer feedback. And lastly, but not least, our project managers. These are the glue, the guidance, and the developers behind the scenes of Rios Country Cancer. They are skilled communicators, both uh, U.S. and non-U.S. facing, and they are going to be helping onboard each new medical student team that comes and assist with project success and growth. Uh, I call them the spirit of RCC, and um, these are uh, pre-med students in their gap year, uh, and I really think that with, with this immersive experience that they have 
learning not just from our organization, but the work of other organizations in this field that were beginning a pipeline of global health leaders and some nice uh, advocacy for radiation oncology. So what is the roadmap forward? Here's how I would define six months success for us. 2020, we're in January right now, we've just started our SBRT and SRS curriculum. Um, some of it, uh, it, it, most of it, and about half of it, I would say <laughs> in Spanish, <laughs> working uh, towards 100% uh, when we can uh, build up the, the right team. And uh, eventually we'll be expanding this to, to other regions. Uh, but for this next six months, uh, in March, we'll start IMRT for radiation therapists, that one in Spanish. Um, we'll also start uh, 2D to 3D for external beam radiation therapy in Africa and probably Middle East. Um, and our HDR brachytherapy curriculum, we would like to uh, do the second iteration, uh, first in Africa, where there are many more centers that need this, um, and then in Latin America in April. And in Asia, uh, in the Philippines, we are starting our first head and neck contouring and evaluation curriculum. Uh, we haven't formed the teams yet for the brachytherapy curriculum and for the 2D to 3D external beam. Uh, there will be more information coming about that. And we are refining right now our 3D to IMRT curriculum for medical physicists. It's going to be great. And then from six to 12 months, I would like us to launch our improved 3D to IMRT curriculum in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in Asia in coordination with partners. I think that we will have the capacity to do our third iteration of the HDR brachytherapy curriculum in all of these regions in coordination with partners. And I believe our third iteration of SBRT and SRS curriculum will be ready once again in Latin America and also in Asia where uh, they tend to have more robust machines. Uh, we will probably invite our first European educators. Uh, we have many colleagues in ESTRO who I think are passionate about global health. Uh, and they're also aligned uh, more closely with the African and Middle Eastern time zones. And we'll be working on improving metrics and methods for evaluation, depending on what is desired to be achieved. Uh, we'll be refining our head and neck curriculum, the IMRT for radiation therapists and the 2D to 3D curriculum. And Astro 2020 will be in Miami, and I think we will make a big splash there. Well, we're looking at oh, uh, about 10 cohorts for that and six cohorts for uh, these next six months. So altogether, um, uh, we'll see that we're uh, affecting about 35,000 cancer patients per year. Uh, it comes out to about $1 per cash and per cancer patient life improved and uh, 3,500 per cohort. Um, we're hoping that hospitals cover travel costs for onsite training when it's possible. Um, but, you know, someone had to ask you, you know, what is your, um, what is your financial target as an organization? I, I think we're, we're pretty modest. We, we do a good job of, of leveraging a lot of the existing energy and goodwill. And uh, secondary goals, uh, implementing artificial intelligence, establishing center familiarity with using Prono for cloud-based collaboration, which can help with data collection and collaborative research studies, and equipment needs assessment to help reading hope match donations. And lastly, we're creating a lot of content. And I think there's a lot that we can do with this, including when not limited to disseminating training videos and resources through partner and social media avenues, and crowdsourcing RCC volunteer experiences for public facing campaigns. Uh, there are a lot of people that want to help these patients and they're, and they're not just health professionals. And I think we're in a good position to try to increase this awareness. Um, so by the end of 2020, um, with 16 cohorts, uh, as I said, we would be affecting over 35,000 cancer patients uh, being treated with radiation each year. And I think we can march on forward and really drive this number pretty high. In five years, uh, these are always hard 
interview questions, you know, what, where do you want to be in five years? But I think we can get up to six, 750 cohorts per year conducted regionally by uh, the centers themselves, uh, RCC centers of reference. Uh, no clinic in the world should have education and training be the barrier to delivering high quality care at this time. And radiotherapy uh, will be recognized as a low cost, high impact investment and supported by those outside the field of radiation oncology. Uh, I believe we will um, improve incentives. So it supports forward radiotherapy development. And our Rouse Country Cancer graduate clinics will be among the best clinics in the world. And they will have established training programs themselves to multiply the effect. We will have uh, full-time Rouse Country Cancer positions. We will have many RCC medical student chapters rising against cancer globally across specialties, not just radiation oncology, but we can take this approach and uh, apply it for um, head and neck surgeons, for urologists, for medical oncologists, et cetera. And we can specialize as a broker for solutions to implementation. We are not the big fancy labs developing the things, but we will have a vast network and we will be good at helping um, bring things that can help people to start helping people. Uh, I think we will direct a new wave of uh, low middle income country collaborative research groups. Uh, there's so much research to be done and lots of people want to do research, so I also see this as low-hanging fruit. And each Rios Country Cancer volunteer can maintain relationships with partner clinics for lifelong friendship, uh, professional and personal growth. Um, I think this is what makes it really meaningful to us, and I think we should hold on to this, and I think we can. So, an organization with happy, successful volunteers will be a better organization. I don't think it's a bad idea to uh, encourage the individualism that each of us brings. Um, but with uh, organization, um, we will uh, be able to provide guardrails and let people run with it. And uh, I will be sending a link to roles uh, after this meeting. Um, feel free to share both this presentation and the invitation to volunteer. Um, as far as individual activities, there's too many good things to list. I uh, have to take a look at who's on this call. <laughs> but we have some superstars on here. And I really feel like our fresh take on global health, our close relationship with industry, our camaraderie and intelligence can modernize approaches to global health disparities. It's an honor to be here with you all today, and I hope we can continue to communicate. Uh, I don't want to really be a, an organization that is always asking for money, but we had a lot of people who wanted to give money, <laughs> so we made a donation page. And if you know other people or a special place in society that's looking to contribute to the mission, um, we currently are helping uh, one cancer patient for every dollar that we get, uh, which is a pretty good efficiency. And you can direct them to this page. If, uh, I think a lot of our volunteers feel this, but if you are new to the organization, this is our vision, our mission, our strategic priorities and our values. Uh, our vision is to inspire and empower new leaders to improve cancer care all around the world, working together on shared missions. Our mission uh, improves sustainable access to high quality, timely and affordable radiotherapy for cancer patients in limited resource settings globally. And we will learn from collaborations and apply successful models to meet global needs. We treat education as the doorway to engagement, engagement as a foundation for collaboration, and collaboration as a pathway to accelerate research and clinic development and bilateral teamwork is essential to design and build success. Meaning those in the countries we're working with are not just people we're helping, but they're people that are helping us do a better job. And 
here are our values. Uh, communication, humility, incentive alignment, synergy, not redundancy, outreach, and local input. And if I had to focus on one thing, it would be communication. I think that with so many people wanting to help, communication is the biggest barrier that's hindering immediate progress. I think if everyone <laughs> knew all the specific gaps and all the specific ways that people could help, and people wanted to help, those gaps wouldn't exist. So let's be excellent communicators to eradicate disparities that simply shouldn't exist. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, we covered the problem that we we're addressing, the ways to approach the problem, RCC's path and strategic vision, clarifying organizational versus individual activities. Hopefully mission command was clear of what we've done, how we work together, med students, residents, educators, and how our roadmap forward looks for the next six months, how I've defined success, and uh, how everyone can go and be a little ray and shine. So thank you. And at this time, if there are any questions, be happy to take those. Okay, very good. Uh, everyone's microphone is muted. So if you're trying to talk, I don't hear you right now. Hey, Benjamin, I, I want to thank you for all the effort you put into this and your availability. And, you know, somebody emailed me like a medical student about like, what we were uh, doing in global health, in radiation oncology, et cetera. And I mentioned you and, I mean, without seeing your presentation, I mean, intuitively, just because of all the things you're doing, uh, you know, Rajos is really about education. And I think, you know, from all the, the things that we've been uh, working on and just having it focused and on paper, uh, I totally agree. I, I think Rajos' strength is going to be education and it's just going to keep growing. Yeah, good job, uh, seriously. I'm quite impressed. It's a really nice day. And like I said, uh, I showed you that email. I didn't know that you guys had already established that HDR break therapy program, so you can count me in for that one. Excellent, thanks, Jose. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you we for the invitation, uh, and um, uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, but uh, really congratulations on this really great end of it. No, thank you to, uh, to everyone. Uh, really, this, I'm, I'm not the person to be thinking, um, you know, I'm not even an educator. <laughs> so it's, it's just everyone coming together to make this possible. Uh, ben, how hard it is uh, for you to find funds to send um, people, those follow-up visits after the cohort is done, Mm -hmm. um, how hard is it to get people over there to provide that uh, support uh, live training? Um, we, d we don't have a well hashed out model yet. Okay. We're exploring for the first time asking hospitals uh, kind of at the onset of the training. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I said we have eight visits that are pending. So I think two or three of those of hospital administration have agreed to pay, and it's just a bit of a month process for waiting. Mm -hmm. um, the double APM helped fund one of our visits to Zambia. Um, I think Varian helped fund a visit to Nepal. Uh, we had two visitors to Peru who were already going to Peru anyways. <laughs> so we just <laughs> hopped on the boat. You hopped on, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're kind of trying to be res resourceful. Um, uh, I have the MBA and I'm always thinking of interesting business models, uh, but. So um, when those visits occur, is there a, uh, already a plan sort of 
training schedule or, you know, they, mm -hmm. are you sitting there to just teach them how to do this or, or teach them how to do certain things? Is there mm -hmm. something planned or is it just, you know, when they get there, just ask the questions and they'll try to <laughs> walk there. How, how is that training over there mm -hmm. uh, structured? Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one thing that came to my head was if there is a structure to the training that the on-site people are going to do, mm -hmm. since you have put all this thing together on the remote, you can mm -hmm. think about structuring that training remotely too with mm -hmm. video conferencing, like having on a clinic over here set up whatever whatever it is that could be used, hardware, software, but do it online too, the, the training itself. And I don't know if that would be cheaper. I know the, be the best thing is having hand-to-hand -hand interaction, but mm -hmm. lack of the funding, probably mm -hmm. that live interaction on a one-to-one -one can be done in a, in a you know, environment mm -hmm. like this. Uh, that's a really good idea, Jose. Um, so to answer your, your question, we did structure the on-site training visit so that it works synergistically with the, the three or four months of remote training leading up to it. Okay. Uh, this can also help us address what are the gaps in retention based on what we taught so we can focus on making that better next time. Um, I, th I think really that to have the strongest impact, we're going to have to develop a model for remote training and then on-site visit and then mm -hmm. remote follow-up and maybe okay. keep going back and forth. And I haven't counted the numbers yet, but I think with the rising interest, even if one educator was paired with a clinic for the rest of the time, mm -hmm. you know, no educator ever needs to be trying to hop and handle multiple clinics at once. Mm -hmm. I, I think we can really get good at what we're doing and just use the foundation that we have. Okay. That works. Hey Ben, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the most like pressing needs are currently in terms of volunteer work, like um, like for the most recent stuff? Um, let's see. Uh, I think we are doing pretty well on educators. <laughs> Um, we could use a few more moderators, uh, especially as we have more curriculums coming and I will be less available to moderate. Um, medical students, I think we're actually doing pretty good. We have a, a new chapter, um, so not just Vanderbilt now, but also Einstein Medical College uh, in New York. And I'm here building a UCSF medical student chapter. UT Memphis is building a chapter. Uh, I believe Jefferson might be interested in a chapter too. So um, uh, I don't have a, a set plan for how we'll fund the project managers uh, for this coming year, but we're setting up the interviews, um, which will be happening this coming month. Um, so a little bit of funding there, but really it's, it's not a lot. It's a few thousand dollars. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the project managers are really essential. They, they are kind of like my, my arms um, while I'm in clinic and residency, uh, but I'm learning to, to be an efficient communicator and mentor. Uh, it's really gratifying for me, uh, but uh, you know, I don't think this would be possible without the, these dedicated project managers. And as we have more and more medical students helping and, and people getting involved, uh, you know, there are going to be questions that come up. And so I'm going to train our project managers to train the future trainers. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, Thank you, go. Ben. This has been so awesome. I have to head out, but um, I think talking from the med student perspective, um, it's been just so wonderful for you to um, find ways to include us and help us um, build this with you and allow us ways to like stay involved like as we move forward. I think that's um, a lot of projects aren't really structured that way in med school, and this is just something that I anticipate working on for years and years and years to come. So just wanted to say thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.
And um, I, since we have a, just a, a little bit more time, I, I do want to say that uh, we have Noah. Uh, actually, I don't know how to say your last name, Noah. I don't think I've ever said it. <laughs> it's Hunthausen. We have Noah Hunthausen um, from BioVentures and Global Health. Um, they're actually one of our new partners helping in, in Africa. If you've seen our latest newsletter, um, I, I really have had a great time working with Noah so far. Um, hopefully this helps the BBGH team um, kind of see how we can help. But uh, I don't know if you want to speak for, for just a moment on, on your perspective as an organization that helps from multiple angles and kind of the gap you've seen in radiation oncology. Yeah, so it's funny. I was just going to speak up, and then you introduced me. But yeah, it's it's been um it's been great working with Ras Country Cancer and Ben. Um, so we're a nonprofit based in Seattle, Washington, and we're a organization that works with Af six different African governments um, on cancer care capacity building in, in many different areas within that. Um, so we work in Rwanda, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, Senegal, and Nigeria, and we work with these ministries of health who have a national cancer control plan so they're prioritizing cancer and they direct us to uh, the hospitals that we work with so we're working now with 41 hospitals and so we uh, we do really comprehensive needs assessment at the at these hospitals um, in every discipline of oncology whether it's uh, staff and equipment and how they're currently procuring drugs and quality of those drugs and the prices of those drugs and then we work with um, industry partners and other nonprofits to basically fill the gaps. And so a lot of our work is with drug access. So we work with um, big international pharmaceutical companies, 11 different companies to uh, provide reduced prices for cancer medicines um, in a really affordable and sustainable way. And then we also um, work in this area, which is training uh, for various uh, physicians, types of physicians within the oncology space. And so um, a lot of the hospitals that we work with have, you know, donated radiotherapy equipment that has been uh, really on goodwill donated to them by companies like Varian and Electa. And they really, they, they do a good job of offering some initial training. Um, and so they kind of get the services up and running a little bit, but then they mm -hmm. are not, not at all using them to the full potential. And so, um, they've consistently, our, our hospitals identify uh, this as a need. And so we work with uh, Rouse Country Cancer to really, what we've done so far is this, um, the first iteration of the HDR brachytherapy course. And so we've coordinated um, Lagos University Teaching Hospital. They've participated in the first course. And then we've, we've been made aware of um, uh, several other hospitals who have very similar needs in this area where they've had equipment placed. Uh, but it's either not commissioned yet or they need additional training to really full, fully utilize the equipment. So it's been great. Um, it's a great, great partnership between BBGH and Rouse Country Cancer because it's such a good match in terms of us you know, identifying these gaps where equipment has been placed, um, but there's training needs. And this is really right in Rouse Country Cancer's wheelhouse. So it's been an exciting partnership, and I think there's going to be a lot more to come. Awesome. Thanks, Noah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the need is real. It's, it's relevant. It's happening right now. Um, and it's, it's kind of frustrating to see people really wanting to help. Um, and so, you know, this is what fuels me every day, uh, you know, getting home from work and just thinking, you know, I, I don't want to be the bottleneck. I don't want to be the reason that stuff isn't happening because um, there's, there's hundreds if not thousands of patients being treated each day with um, clinicians who are, are either scared of what they're doing or maybe not aware of, of mistakes that are happening. And uh, I, I just worry that patients are being treated and uh, the dose is off. Um, they're not reaching curative treatments. Um, and they're, they're just getting toxic side effects. And that's the saddest thing. Mm -hmm. And the governments are, are spending their money. They're, they're trying to help cancer, but it's, it's, uh, they're missing this important piece. Agreed. Hey, man, I don't know if you send it in your slides, but if you can send it to me in a private email, 
Uh, what are the specific um, duties and responsibilities and tasks of uh, project managers and how much of a time commitment are we talking about? If you can send me that you know, in a private communication, I can take a peek at it and see where I'm at. Sure. And um, I, I'm actually, uh, uh, this will be in the form that I send you guys, but um, these are the roles that, that we're kind of opening up right now. Um, uh, I really respect the time that, that our educators have given. And, and I know we're kind of like later in our careers, we have families and we're, we're all trying to do global health on the side. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really asking much more from the educators. You, you guys are, are great and our organization is running really well with you. Um, but we do have a lot of young, um, young energy, uh, fourth year medical students who have identified a clear interest in global health. They want this as part of their career. And uh, I want to help springboard their careers. And I, I think they can get involved helping lead other medical students as uh, directors of education, thinking strategically about different regions and, you know, what curriculum should we use where we have it and what is needed to, to build. Um, for the residents who are also busy, <laughs> but, uh, you know, honestly, the, the education and training that's happening is, is like a win-win when you join to moderate because it's also a lecture that's relevant for your education. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. And then um, uh, on-site educators, uh, we'll, we'll kind of have to see it. I think once we have a, an established funding mechanism, uh, I, I wouldn't like this to ever be a, a barrier. Um, I think if someone wants to take time off from work to help uh, a clinic in a different country, that, that we should never let money get in the way of that. Yeah. And... Uh, I've been focused on a lot of doing, 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 but you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm in radiation oncology. We are an academic field and uh, we should write about what we're doing. And um, I am certainly not qualified to be the main editor of all of our papers. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would love if there was maybe a, a, a late career um, physician or, or, or someone who has more time on their hand and, and would, the delight in just reading some of our manuscripts and providing edits and feedback, uh, especially from someone that doesn't know Rigo's country cancer very well, because there's so many biases and things that, that I assume that, oh, is, is really clear and obvious, but that they will help to point out the things that, that's missing. You know, we, we recently submitted something about our, our model of medical students helping uh, drive Project ECHO efforts, which, which I think is great. It's really novel. Most Project ECHOs require um, $200,000 to $250,000 per year for a couple full-time employees. But uh, we do multiple programs per year for free. Uh, um, what, what, are you specific to just late career physicians? Um, no, no. Uh, this is like my first draft of. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just asking. I just didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, uh, but but then we also have. Um, oh, so to, to finish my story, uh, the paper was was rejected because reading it, they they thought that medical students were providing the education. Mm. And and I I thought we were really clear about that wording, but it, what we're doing is is new. It's surprising to me, but it's really new. If you Google telehealth brigades, there's zero search results. Mm -hmm. We're, we're got probably going to be the first search result. And, you know, telehealth, a lot of people think of telemedicine, you know, doctors providing cares to patients. Mm -hmm. but this is a peer-to-peer -peer approach. And mm -hmm. this, this isn't a single institutional thing. Um, you know, most Project Echoes are built out of you know, one, one hospital and they're building fame and glory for themselves. But, or, I'm just kidding. They're, they're really healthy people, but it, it's hard to organize stuff between multiple institutions. Um, we kind of have the advantage of, of being a small field. So it's really easy to network. Um, for a research advisor, uh, this is a role where they'd probably work more closely with the teams um, on specific projects and providing mentorship, uh, providing guidance for research and maybe assisting in publication efforts. Um, and then lastly, there's this creative commons where 
uh, you know, we can make a podcast from all the material that we've built. We could uh, work on um, a cool, uh, sorry, this is movie, uh, you know, a small documentary about the importance of, of what we're doing. Um, and then if you have other ideas, uh, you'll be able to submit that in the form as well. Hey Ben, can you make this video or this presentation available so we can share it in professional social media? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think that could raise awareness. Okay, uh, great. We'll do that. We'll have many memorable lines. <laughs> yeah, thanks for what you're doing, man. You're doing a good job and I will encourage each one of the listeners to, to share this presentation with your colleagues. Most definitely. More yeah the more we we can reach out to professionals in the field i think this is a noble approach yeah okay great yeah well i'll send an email that has a, a link to the presentation uh, a link to the video and the volunteer form and you guys right. can share it with with your colleagues um and thank you guys uh, All right. you're multiplying the effect <laughs> <laughs> well we're on a charge now. Yes. So, good night to everybody. This was really great. Ben, I'm sorry I was not at the, uh, the meeting on Monday. Um, I told uh, um, Ramsey to no send worries. me the, the, um, what was discussed and, and what the schedule is. And like I said, um, I, I don't know if you're already booked up with the HDR brachytherapy, but at least uh, – uh, um, that, that would probably be my strongest suit, mm -hmm. my my area that I work more. So Great. for the upcoming ones, I would mind, uh, um, you know, looking at what the curriculum looks like, looking at presentations and preparing presentations and whatnot and seeing, uh, you know, even giving them. So let me know. Awesome. Great. All right. We will be in touch, everyone. Thank you so much right. for joining. Uh, if I didn't say hi personally, um, I see your name on the call. So thank you for doing right. that. Bye bye. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ben. See y'all later. Okay. Good night. Bye, guys. Good job. Good job. Thanks, everyone.